So I'm going to be covering Seventh-day Adventism. The reason why is because I notice that there are people who watch us online who are into a bit of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. So I'm hoping that throughout this discipleship, it can help them open their eyes about what's wrong with the movement. So let's start out with Genesis chapter 2, please. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 2. Now, one thing you're going to notice about the Seventh-day Adventists that I'm going to spend a lot of time debunking is the Sabbath. That's the big thing about Seventh-day Adventists, which is kind of a no-brainer. The kind of a no-brainer is that these people are called Seventh, see that? Seventh-day Adventist. So these people, they make a huge deal on the seventh day. Now, I'm going to give you a few beliefs that Seventh-day Adventists believe in that you probably didn't know about or you probably already know. So I'm not going to spend time debunking these particular beliefs because they were already debunked with the Jehovah Witness. So in our lesson on Jehovah Witnesses, you heard me debunk a few of them. So Seventh-day Adventists, here are their following beliefs. One is they do not believe in eternal damnation. They do not believe in eternal damnation. That was debunked on our Jehovah Witness video. They do not believe that a soul departs and goes immediately to heaven or to hell after they die. They believe in a doctrine called soul sleep. If you remember my teaching on Jehovah Witnesses, soul sleep is they believe the soul basically sleeps after you die and then until the final day of judgment or resurrection, then they start to wake up. We deny this. We believe after you die, you immediately go to hell or you immediately go to heaven. All right, so soul sleep, they believe in that. Now, what distinguishes them from Jehovah Witnesses is that they do believe Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Ghost is one God. So they believe in the Trinity or the Godhead. So this one they believe, okay? Okay. So they are not the same as Jehovah Witness. That's why I'm going to box on that one. They believe like we do on that, just to let you know. Seventh-day Adventists, they make a big deal on diet and law of Moses. These people are so big on dietary rules and as well as the Old Testament law. We're going to debunk more concerning the Old Testament law matter, but these, are, these people are huge on dietary matters. All right, the last thing concerning about Seventh-day Adventists that you probably didn't know about, which is very infamous, but I kind of taught it to you at our Jehovah Witness class. They believe Satan is the scapegoat. Okay, now this sounds really blasphemous. Basically, they believe that I think they're worse than Jehovah Witnesses, actually, in this sense. Because Jehovah Witnesses, they believe in annihilation. If you are a lost sinner, they believe that you go to the lake of fire and poof, you're annihilated. But these people go as so far as to say that Satan will take the sins of all of mankind at the final judgment, lost and saved, and that they will put it upon this scapegoat, which is Satan. So Satan will be that scapegoat who will take the sins of all the world and cast Satan into the lake of fire. Now that is blasphemous heresy because we believe Jesus Christ is the scapegoat on our behalf who took our sins. And it is up to you to receive that scapegoat or you reject that scapegoat. It's not like some Calvinistic, Calvinistic forcible salvation where lost souls and saved souls, they get their sins on Satan anyway. That's not how it works. Okay, so these are the uh, main areas concerning about Jehovah, uh, not Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventists that you want to keep in mind. There's one more thing that I would probably say. They were infamous for their rapture datings, just like the Jehovah Witnesses. So they were very bad on this one as well. So as a matter of fact, the Jehovah, Wit Charles Russell's people and Ellen G's white people, they one time got together before thinking that this rapture would hit on this specific date. So it shows birds of a feather flock together. See? Evil communications corrupt good manners. See, these Seventh-day Adventists are not so Christian as you might think they are. They're very similar with Jehovah Witness. And Mormons, they're very similar with Masons. 
And in the Catholic Church, it's pretty much the evil of everything. You'll find any religion similar with what the Catholic Church teaches. So uh, keep an eye out. Keep an eye out. These are cults, infamous cults. Okay. Now, let's debunk this notion concerning the Sabbath. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 through 3. Verses 2 through 3. This is the favorite proof text used by Seventh-day Adventists to prove that the Lord honored the Sabbath day. So because he honored the Sabbath day, we should all likewise honor the Sabbath day as well. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his, ended his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Look at this. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So notice that because God did this ever since the beginning of creation, why aren't we all doing it? So that's how Seventh-day Adventists will argue. So they will use Genesis chapter 2. Uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, in which that ever since creation, creation basically blessed the Sabbath. So because creation blessed the Sabbath, should we not all observe the Sabbath day as well? There's also a Hebrew verb that's mentioned in this passage as well. Uh, as well. Shabbat, Shabbat. So they would use some Hebrew words to kind of point it out, just like a Jehovah Witness. They will claim that the sabbatical commandment, the Sabbath, did not start with Moses. Okay, remember this. Sometimes, if you know dispensationalism and you've been in our previous lessons, you kind of know what I'm going to say. If you remember our teachings on dispensationalism at the beginning of intermediate discipleship, you might remember that we argue that we don't observe the Sabbath because it's a part of Moses' law. And Moses' law was done away with at the cross, correct? So that's how we argue. But what they're going to argue is that it's not started with Moses' law. It started at the beginning of creation. That's how they're going to argue to get around it. Now, keep your hand at Genesis 2. We're going to look at Exodus 16, please. Exodus chapter 16. This is their other proof text to prove and to use that people were observing the Sabbath before Moses' law. Look at Genesis chapter 16 and verse 23. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, keep in mind this, they're more scripturally minded than Jehovah Witnesses, or JWs, as I call them. So keep that in mind. Seventh-day Adventists, they're more scripturally minded. And what I mean by that is sound. They sound more scriptural than Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah Witnesses, they're just so used to lying because they talk to so many doors. So they're used to lying and go away around. So they can be the most annoying to talk to. But Seventh-day Adventists, the way that they discuss with you a scripture is that they're more scripturally sound. So because of this, you have to be aware of these verses I'm going to pull up to you. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 16 and verse 23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seize that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept unto, unto the morning, until the morning, excuse me. Look at 28 through 29. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Okay, this is important because Exodus 16 seems to be the really good proof text for Seventh-day Adventists because you got to realize this, the Ten Commandments did not start until Exodus 20. Exodus 20 is when they started the Ten Commandments. So notice right here, before the Ten Commandments, before Moses' law, that God already gave a commandment on the Sabbath. See, so this will be a good proof text for Seventh-day Adventists again. Not only that, if you show them Exodus 20, go to Exodus 20. If you show them Exodus 20, 
That's not going to help your case. You might say, why? Because they're going to point out the wording here. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Notice that the passage did not say keep the Sabbath at Exodus 20, verse 8. It says in Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath, right? As if the Lord gave a commandment before. See that? It, it's not the first time the Lord gave a commandment on observing the Sabbath. It was as if the Lord already gave the commandment on the Sabbath a long time ago, so God's telling them to remember. So to give the argument that the Sabbath is under Moses' law and Jesus' cross done away, Moses' law and Sabbath is not going to work because Seventh-day Adventists are going to point out, no, the Sabbath was observed before Moses' law, before Exodus 20 when God gave the Ten Commandments. And even if you show them Exodus 20, they're going to point out the wording remember as if it was already given commandment long before. So that's going to be a problem. Let's also look at Mark chapter 2. Now, I believe this is their number one strongest passage. This is what I believe is their number one strongest passage, is Mark chapter 2. Oh man, pastor, you're scaring me already. You know, these verses look strong enough. That's why you got to study the scriptures. If you don't study the scriptures, friend, Satan's people will. And remember this, Satan is wiser than Daniel, and Satan quoted scripture to Jesus. You don't think that the devil's people don't know as much scripture as you do. That's why it's so important that you study, that you read the Bible, that you attend a Bible-believing church and grow in much knowledge as you can. If you don't, then the devil's people are going to stomp on you. All right, so I think, in my opinion, Mark chapter 2, verse 27 is their strongest passage. Notice right here that Jesus Christ, he mentioned, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was, look at this, made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Uh-oh. So it seems like when God created a seventh day, ever since the beginning, he deliberately created that seventh day for man to observe. So in my opinion, I think that's the strongest passage. Sabbath was created. So how do you answer these problem areas? Simple. Sometimes you're sick and tired of hear, hearing me say simple because it doesn't look simple. But if you read the passage, just study the scriptures, you'll realize how it's debunked. Let's start off with Genesis chapter 2, shall we? Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. So what you need to do is that you need to study the scripture. Because if you just look at if you just look at the scriptures that the devil shows you, obviously it looks convincing. But when you study for yourself and let the Holy Spirit show you, you'll realize how much of a lie. Satan does put out on you and how much a liar he is, and it's a plain as a nose on your face lie. Okay, so let's start with Genesis chapter 2. We'll look at verses 2 through 3. Now, pay attention to this. It is true that if you look at verse 3, the Bible says that God sanctified the Sabbath day. But you got to realize this. Keep in mind this. Notice that God mentioned that at verses 1 through 2. Uh, excuse me, verses 2 through 3, he mentioned that but he never gave that command to Adam. Did you notice that? <laughs> so it's as if God himself did this. Why? Because God knows what he's going to do in the future. See that? By the way, this is a no-brainer if you really studied your Bible. Genesis, who's the author of Genesis? <laughs> See that? Why do you think Moses will mention that then? See, that's the reason why Moses will mention it, because why? He was the one responsible for giving the commandment to observe the Sabbath to the Jewish people. See that? But it was never directly commanded to God's people at Genesis. It wasn't. It was not. It just simply said that God honored and sanctified the Sabbath. That's it. 
It never said he told them to observe the Sabbath. See, they're not reading. Remember one of the key things with cults, they don't read the verse as it says. They automatically show you the verse, interpret it, and they fool you. You notice the way that I explained at the beginning was very persuasive. But Satan can be very persuasive with this serpent tongue like he did with Eve. But I sure fooled you because you weren't looking at the verse and reading it as it says. See that? That's Satan's trick. That is Satan's trick. By the way, here's another thing to think about. If they honestly believe that Adam was a Seventh-day Adventist, Oh, I'm going to worship God and honor God on the Sabbath day. Let's use our brain cells here. Do you think it was only Saturday that Adam honored and worshiped the Lord? Or it was every day in the garden as he walked and talked with God? See that? Think about that. Why did God put the Sabbath law to begin with with Moses? Because they were all busy like a lot of us stupid Americans, and I'm going to say stupid Americans, amen. We're so busy here and there. Work, school, driving through traffic. I need to get the, uh, this thing needs to go faster with my cell phone, the computer, TV, and let's go drinking and sinning. And because of that ring around the rosy, God wants you to say, hey, it's about time you go to church. That's why it's good that you have church time and amen for that, because you finally, and a lot of you know that I'm right about this, if you've been in our church for a while, you know that by coming to this church, you forcibly set, set aside your wicked, busy, hectic schedule and finally be able to take time to just be still and know that I am God. Amen. You get refreshed by fellowship. You grow more in knowledge with the Bible study. Singing, preaching, you get under conviction, get some things right with God. Shamefully, we should be doing this daily, but let's be honest, we're all flesh, which is why it's best to set a day aside. That's why the Jews, they were so busy. That's why the Lord made them and gave them a day. That way they can set, set some time to observe God. Because they're not like Adam walking and talking with God every day. They weren't in the Garden of Eden like Adam. So they had to have a Sabbath day. Okay. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 through 3 again. Now, the thing that just <laughs> annoys me the most, and I criticize this very hard. Now, you know your pastor does this. Because he hates it when people try to act some kind of smart aleck when they're actually an amateur. But then they pretend they're smart, smarter than you, put you down, and deceive you. That's what ticks off your pastor the most. So you know that. That's why the Lord, he goes for the simple. He goes for the poor people. He goes to the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and sinners. He goes for them. Not to some educated snob, some fatted Pharisee. Okay, now they're going to, remember that Hebrew word that I use, Shabbat? Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? I don't care. All right? But let's do this. They're going to use that Hebrew verb Shabbat at Genesis chapter 2. So because Genesis chapter 2 mentions Shabbat, they will use this to prove, as I mentioned before, that this must mean then that we got to observe the Sabbath. So that's how they're going to argue. If you look at Genesis 2, 2 through 3, it never says Sabbath. It says seventh day, right? So they're going to automatically say the Hebrew verb, verb is Shabbat. So that means Sabbath. So notice Sabbath was mentioned at Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. That's how they get around this. Now, the simple answer to this is you don't know Hebrew, okay? So this is why I get really hard on Greek and Hebrew scholars and your pastor has no apology whatsoever. And James White can cry like a baby all he wants and accuse me of verbal abuse. I don't care. These people tick me off the most in fooling people who have a love for God's word and use Greek and Hebrew so that they can cloud where they're caught in their weak area and talk you down with Greek and Hebrew. I don't like that, period. You notice your pastor does not treat you like that in this church. He goes down to your level. Jesus went down to where the sinners were and worked with them. You, know, you notice how he treated the Pharisees when he fellowshiped with them? He talked down on them. You know, because these people talk like snobs. Okay, now, uh, I'm going to quit ranting right here, but Shabbat, look. Okay, 
This is the key. I want you to always remember this whenever they use Greek and Hebrew on you. You pick up a Greek and Hebrew lexicon and you can even find it online. By the way, your pastor here debunked these Greek and Hebrew scholars mostly like 80% through online lexicons. Okay, so you can even pick that up online. Okay? Oh, you didn't know that, huh? You know, I see these scholars want to trample on you, trick you. So I want you people who don't know Hebrew and Greek, trample on them. Make these scholars look bad. Okay, you know what this word means? It means rested. Now look at Genesis 2, 2 through 3. Doesn't it say rested? Yes, it says. So what do you think the KJV translators is? They translated this word to rested. Shabbat, where they're trying to say Sabbath, is not a translation. That's a transliteration. Now, you notice the Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists, they all make this dumb little mistake. You notice that? Remember the Jehovah Witness argument? It's not hell, it's Hades. Well, hey, dummy, that's a transliteration. Translation is hell. Now, why do I keep calling them names? Because it infuriates me that these people fool you with Greek and Hebrew because you don't know Greek and Hebrew. That's what scholars do. Do you know why they pull up big words on you in terminologies and mention you're not a scientist like me? That's why you have no say to correct me. They do that so they can act elitist on you so that they can win an argument. They refuse to get to the truth of the matter and discuss it from there. They say, until you know like I do with this term and uh, with science, etc., then you can tell me what to do. No! Who cares? We have the freedom right here. You ain't no elitist king dictating my life and my conscience. That was the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. Didn't you know that? The Catholic Church in the Dark Ages thought they can dictate the consciences of poor farmers and plowboys because they thought they know it all. Now today, scholars, they think they're so smart that they criticize the Dark Age scholars. You wicked blankety blank you, man. You're no different from the Dark Age scholars. Mankind never learns their lesson. Give it a thousand years, I bet you a thousand years later, those scholars would be poking fun at today's scholars. Oh, yeah. These bunch of... Every, mankind did not change. Schola scholarship did not change from the B.C.s to today. It did not change. The common denominator they hold is man at his own wisdom at pride. Okay. Now... The thing is this, is that, by the way, here's a funny thing. It not only means rested, there are several translations. It also means to destroy. So I guess God destroyed the seventh day, right? Would that support the seventh day argument? No. So look at that. They're picking and choosing definitions. Another word is put an end to. So God put an end to the seventh day. Are we going to say that? <laughs> cause to fail. That's what it also means. So God caused the seventh day to fail. So when a seventh day Adventist acts all smart Alec on you with Hebrew, you can use this on them. Didn't you know Hebrew it actually means to destroy this, the seventh day? So this debunks your seventh day Adventist religion. See them flip after that. See them flip. Because if you notice right here that the verse says at verse 2, he rested on the seventh day, right? How about we translate that he destroyed the seventh day, right? He put an end to the seventh day. He got rid of seventh-day Adventism, see? So this could actually support our argument. So if they use Hebrew on you, you use Hebrew on them. Okay, here's another one. Let's also look at... Ah, okay, so I, I put a lot of verses right here. Okay, so not only that, we're not going to turn to these verses, but I'm surprised. I put a lot of verses for these. If you want to point out to them these, this Hebrew word where it destroys the seventh day or put an end to the seventh day, compare it with these verses. Amos chapter 8, verse 4. So we're not going to turn there. Just write these down. Amos 8, 4. Lamentations 5.15, Daniel 9.27. You know what these verses will show? 
It would show that was God commending the people to fail the poor people at Amos 8, 4? Were the people stopping in joy when they were mourning in misery? Lamentations 5. Were the Seventh-day Adventists, I guess, following the Antichrist when he Shabbat the sacrifices? Shabbat means to stop. If they want to use Shabbat as a positive word meaning Sabbath, look at these three verses. It does not make sense. You can't put Sabbath in there. It does not make sense when you put these three verses. If they insist, no, it means Sabbath, then you tell them this. The Antichrist is going to Shabbat you as well at Daniel 9.27. I guess they're following the Antichrist religion then, huh? Okay. Now, uh, I know I got a lot of Seventh-day Adventists mad, but let's look at Exodus 16. Exodus 16. Now, believe it or not, there is a good amount of Seventh-day Adventists who get blessed from our ministry, which is surprising to me. So I thank God for that. I thank God for you. I'm glad we can be a blessing to you. But you got to understand this. This is nevertheless a cult. This is a heretical doctrine. So because of that, I have to expose this. And if I'm angry, I'm not actually angry at you people who get blessed by our videos. I'm actually angry at these false prophets of Seventh-day Adventism who are deceiving souls out there, who talk like this to fool the people. That's what I'm getting on. Now, if you want to still get mad at me after this, that's fine. The judgment seat of Christ will show you my heart after that. That's all I'll say. But I wonder if the judgment seat of Christ can show your heart how you reacted to this video. All right. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. Now, remember, this passage is used by Seventh-day Adventists to supposedly prove the generations of Adam to Moses observe the Sabbath. Because if you look at verse 23, the Lord said tomorrow is the Sabbath that they're going to observe, right? And then verse 28 through 29, God told them, how long will you reject my commandment to not observe the Sabbath, right? I mean, to observe the Sabbath, excuse me. So I already explained you this passage. I'm not going to explain it again. Remember, this passage is before... This passage is before Exodus 20. So there are two problems here. So let's debunk these two passages the Seventh-day Adventists use, which I'm not going to mention again because I already showed it to you. Exodus 16 and 20, remember that? Remember their arguments for this one? Okay, let's cover this. Let's debunk this notion. These two passages do not prove the generations of Adam uh, to Moses observe the Sabbath. It actually confirms the Sabbath started with Moses, not Adam. You might say, why is that? The Seventh-day Adventists will argue, well, right here, Exodus chapter 16, this was before the Ten Commandments at Exodus 20. But here's the simple debunking to that argument. Was God speaking to Adam here or to Moses? Moses! Okay, use your brain cells here. So this does not change the fact this all goes with Moses. By the way, God told the Jews to observe the Passover, right? Isn't that an Old Testament law? Yes. Guess what? The Passover commandment was before his Ten Commandments at Sinai. When we say Moses' law, we're not saying it all starts at Exodus 20. That's not what we're saying. We're simply saying everything that evolved, uh, that went around Moses when he gave the laws and commandments. It's that simple. It, Exodus 20 and 16 does not prove it went from Adam all the way to Moses. Do you see that name anywhere? Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Do you see it anywhere at Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day, that Adam and, Adam and Abraham observed the Sabbath day? No, it did not. Well, why would it say the word remember? The reason why it would say remember is because of Exodus 16. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> what are they looking at? They're not looking at it. See, it's, why would God tell them to remember the Sabbath day here? It's because of Exodus 16. 
And Exodus 16 was what? Adam, Abraham, or Moses? Moses. You see the brilliance of the Seventh-day Adventists in interpreting Scripture, but it's also very dangerous. Watch out for these guys. Watch out. What you got to understand is this, is that that is why God told the Israelites to remember the Sabbath day at Exodus 20 because of Exodus 16. If you read Exodus 16, God was angry that they ignored his commandment to observe, observe uh, to, um, they ignored his commandment in observing the Sabbath. And God actually punished them in the food that they ate. That's why Exodus chapter 20, God told Moses, remember, remember? And does not, does not God do that with us, right? In the preaching, you'll hear the same sermon over again, but God's like behind your ear saying, Remember, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and you're like, yep. If you're going to, if you sit down to a service and say, oh, here we go again. I heard this a thousandth time, Pastor. Maybe the Lord did it the thousandth time for a reason. He's probably telling you, remember. All right, let's look at Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. All right, now this is their toughest passage, right? So let's look at Mark chapter 2. Now, remember this, church, is that when you're witnessing to these people, this is an important note, and you should have learned this throughout um, my preaching and basic discipleship. When you witness to these people, you, do, you, don't, uh, you don't bash them. You don't act mean toward them. you got to show the truth in love. In here, because I'm on the pulpit proclaiming God's words, this is different right here. you got to realize this. There is a time and a place for criticizing, and a time and a place to speak in love. It's this, if you talk like sarcasm all the time, then you're not right with God. And if you talk in love all the time, you're not right with God either. There's always a time and a place for everything, so remember that. Remember that. But if you get some kind of James White hocus-pocus on you, Seventh-day Adventist going like this and talking down on you, then you start to jab in a little bit. Jab in a little bit, talk down toward them a little bit, and then see how they feel. If you keep speaking to them in love, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to take advantage of you then, see? See, that's why a time and a place for everything. You've got to think of that. People don't think like that. Okay, now let's look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. All right, this is probably, in my opinion, the toughest passage to crack. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, notice that the Sabbath seems to be made for man. So thus, we cannot eliminate the Sabbath because when God created seven days, he deliberately did this for us. But here's the thing. Remember, Satan does, ignores the context. Did they read verse 28? Notice right here, that the Bible says at uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 27, and then verse 28, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Correct? That's what you see right there. So notice that Jesus Christ, He is in charge. He is Lord over the seventh day, the Sabbath day. But not only that, let's look at hmm, Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. Let's look at Exodus chapter 16, and then we'll read verse 23. Now, notice right here that the first mention, that's the key right here. The Sabbath was made for man, correct? Now, here's the thing. Did it ever say creation in Adam? Ah, see, they're inserting their interpretation again. Yes, the Sabbath was created for man, but let's think about this. When was the first time Sabbath mentioned, the word Sabbath, that was Adam or was it Moses? Ah, Moses, tricky, tricky. See that? You notice how I inserted an interpretation on Mark 2, 27, and it seemed very believable. Yes, we agree the Sabbath was made for man, but it never said Adam or creation. You're inserting your interpretation. 
Think about it. When was the Sabbath? That exact word. Aren't we going literally by the word as it says? That exact word. When was this made? When was this started? When was this created? Right there. That's what they don't show you. That's what they don't show you. Why do you think Jesus told these people the Sabbath was made for man? Because he's an Old Testament Jew under Moses' law. Why else would he say that? That doesn't apply to Christians. See that? It doesn't apply to Christians. This was referring to an Old Testament Jewish standpoint right there. What they remember, the Seventh-day Adventists, they're going to say, no, Sabbath was first mentioned at Genesis 2. Remember they said that? Because of, the, uh, because of what? Because of some silly word, Shabbat, right? Remember that? When they do that on you, then start using those passages that I showed you, that no, it did not say that. You know what the Bible says? The Bible never said Sabbath. It said seventh day at Genesis 2. The Bible said Sabbath at Exodus 16. Why? Why? Because obviously, what are you going to call uh, Saturday or seventh day? What are you going to call that? Why do you think God called it the seventh day? Because he said the first day, the second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. That's what he said at Genesis. That's why he said seventh day. He wasn't thinking about Mosaic observance of the Sabbath, etc. He was just simply going by the day system right here. But the word Sabbath, he didn't say seventh day at Exodus 16. He said Sabbath. Why? Because this is a Mosaic Jewish standpoint now. See, there's a difference right here. We literally go by the verse as it says, and you notice that is something I stress so many times in all my teachings. Otherwise, wrong doctrine will form and come out. Now, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. It is very upsetting and sad how much wrong doctrine is out there, and it looks believable. It looks believable. That's why I had a heavy burden to go online, see? Because there's so much garbage that you see online of her heresy, wrong doctrine, and even teaching that would damn a person's soul to hell. Now let's look at Nehemiah chapter 9, and then we'll read verse 14. Now, you want to know this passage. This is for you. This is a very strong passage for you that you want to use on a Seventh-day Adventist. You ready for this? Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 14 through 15. And madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Ah, God made known to the people about observing the Sabbath. But look at the timeline and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the, what? Adam and Eve, by Abraham. No, by the hand of Moses thy servant. Boom. That is proof. They didn't know. Okay, if they want to say, notice that these people were observing the Sabbath ever since Adam's timeline. No, they didn't even know. They didn't even know. It wasn't until Moses. How about that? By the way, remember Genesis 2, where it says God rested on the seventh day and sanctified it. Who was the writer, obviously? Moses. See? Now let's also keep reading right here. We're going to read verse 15. And gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promised us them that they should go in to possess the land, which thou hast sworn to give them. See, this is all referring to the Jewish context of Moses' law. Mosaic law, Mosaic law. This was not before Moses. Now, there are some people, I'm not saying it's all Seventh-day Adventists, but there are some out there who believe observing the Sabbath is part of your salvation. So when they argue this, you want to use this verse on them. Show them this. Oh, does that, the, then I guess Adam and Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes, they went to hell, right? Or they lost their salvation because they don't believe in hell. I guess they're not saved, right? Because this verse shows that no one knew until Moses, by the hand of Moses. 
So this is a very powerful verse that you want to memorize and know. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 14 through 15. It will come in handy. All right. Let's also look at Mark chapter 2 again. Mark chapter 2. Now let's repeat this passage that Seventh-day Adventists use. We're going to look at Mark chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 27, Mark chapter 2. We'll read verse 27. Notice right here, said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, right? Then they're going to use verse 28 as well. So let's add this together. Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. Now I pointed that to you, right? So this seems to show right here that rejecting the Sabbath seems to be rejecting Jesus Christ. That's what they're going to point out right here. It seems to be a real bad thing, a blasphemous thing. Oh, God forbid. So, you know, we should, so, you know, you can't do anything about it. But here's the thing is that if we're going to concentrate on verse 28 right here, verse 28, it says Jesus is the Lord over the Sabbath, right? That's all it says. All it's showing right here is Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. Why would he say something like that? It's very simple. Because if you read the context here, look at verses 23 through 27. And then we got to close it right here. Look at verses 23 through 27. Notice right here that the Pharisees argue that you're like breaking the Sabbath day right here, right? Jesus Christ, it is so simple. He's saying right here that I'm the Lord over the Sabbath day so I can do whatever I want. That doesn't mean that you have to, all of you got to observe the Sabbath day. That's not what it's saying. It just means what it says. I'm Lord over the Sabbath. Isn't that simple to understand? Isn't that true? By the way, if you want to say that this passage exclusively, exclusively has to be only Sabbath, then you got a problem here. If you want to make it only exclusively restricted to Sabbath, then you're saying Jesus is only Lord over the Sabbath. If that's what you want to say, then that means Jesus is not the Lord over Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, over your life. No, Jesus is the Lord of everybody's lives and days. That's how it should be. You can't just restrict it to Sabbath for crying out loud. Look at the con They don't look at context. They automatically throw an interpretation over there. By the way, here's something very easy. If Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath, he can do whatever he wants with the Sabbath, correct? Now, remember, the context was these Seventh-day Adventist Pharisees were accusing Jesus, you're breaking the Sabbath, right? But Jesus said, I can do whatever I want with the Sabbath. If Jesus told New Testament Christians today that the Sabbath is no longer to apply to the church, he can do whatever he wants, yes? No Pharisaical Seventh-day Adventist then has the right, just like Mark chapter 2, to tell you, oh, you're breaking the Sabbath. When Seventh-day Adventists use this passage on you, you can actually turn the tables on them and show them, no, this passage is actually talking about you guys, that you guys are the Pharisees, denying Jesus as the Lord over the Sabbath. That's how you can catch them. That's how you can catch them. Okay, now, um, in your homework assignment, you're going to be uh, listening to the video, How to Witness to Muslims. How to Witness to Muslims. So that is within our How to Witness playlist. I will put the link at the end of this video. Let's close. Heavenly Father, I want to pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. As we continue our teaching on Seventh-day Adventism, I pray that you'll soften the people's hearts in here and online to accept Bible-believing truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, 
The point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.